Hey everybody, it's Joe Solari here with the Business of Writing. Today we're going to talk audio books with Will Dagas from Find Away Voices. Welcome, Will. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So why don't you, just to get everybody up to speed, tell us a little bit about Find Away Voices because, um, you know, for some of the folks that are watching this, they probably are not super familiar with all the moving parts in the audiobook world. And yeah, sure. our, ho our hope is by the time they're done watching this, they're going to be experts in understanding the, the marketplace <laughs> and how they can participate in it. So Absolutely, yeah. So, so Find Away Voices has been around for about two years now. We're an audiobook company. Uh, we're a product within a larger company called Find Away. It's been around for about 15 years, and we've been in the audiobook market the whole time. So... Uh, the company is filled with audio experts, and we have uh, deep connections all throughout the industry within uh, both retailers and some of the biggest publishers in the world and some of the authors uh, that everybody knows and loves. So uh, Findaway Voices is kind of our self-publishing platform. So you can use Findaway Voices to create an audiobook uh, if you have a finished manuscript and you want to get it narrated. Uh, or if you, you know, make your audiobook with, from any means, not necessarily producing through us, you can also uh, just upload your audio files, fill in all the metadata fields, and uh, ship it off to 33 retailers across the world. So uh, we're the wide audiobook distribution option. And if you want your audiobook in every store in the world instead of just a couple, uh, we can help get you there. So to kind of paraphrase, in one respect, you, part of the business is kind of like draft to digital, where you, you, you help them to um, be a one stop shop to distribute audiobooks. And then the other part of it is you help them to get the finished product made. Yeah. So if you're familiar with draft to digital it's easy to think of us as draft to digital for audio. And uh, you know, 2 years ago we actually launched with draft to digital as a as a great partner uh, and they have been fantastic partners ever since. So we have a deep integration with them. If you're in the draft to digital website and you make your book, you're going to see little little hints all over the place to turn that book into an audio book. And we have, you know, an API integration with them. So you click that button, it sends over your artwork, all the metadata that's relevant. You don't have to enter it in again on our website. And it, it's a really smooth experience from one to the, the other. So uh, draft to digital is, is a great framework. If you're familiar with them, think about uh, uh, find away voices as being drafted digital for audio. Cool. So, well, why don't you kind of start at a high level and help me and the folks watching to understand, you know, what the audiobook market looks like, you know, if, if you have a feel for, you know, sales on an annual basis, growth, who growth the players been, are. Yeah, absolutely. All that so stuff. The, the growth of the audiobook market has been incredible. We're seeing double digit growth year over year for the past five or six years. It's the fastest growing segment in the publishing industry. This is where, uh, this is the bright, shiny object that everybody's running towards because there's so much potential here and we don't see any signs of it stopping uh, growing. Uh, it is gaining popularity because uh, everybody has a phone in their pocket now and it's a great listening experience from your smartphone. Uh, smart speakers are starting to be in almost everybody's houses now, and all of those smart speakers are great uh, ancillary experiences for audiobooks. Uh, the rise of podcasting has gotten people used to listening to spoken word audio during their commutes, their workouts, while they're washing dishes, uh, or even just relaxing at home at the end of the night. You're done with all your chores and your, your work day's over and you want to kick back and relax. People are, are increasingly choosing audiobooks and podcasts as their relaxation uh, uh, activity over TV. So all of those things have contributed to the growth of the audiobook market. It's a really exciting time to be in the space. There's also more options for more retailers than ever before. More ways to get audiobooks, to buy them, Netflix type subscription uh, services where you can listen to all that you want or options from your local library that still have a great listening experience. And the rise of technology from the recording side has made the investment to get an audiobook cheaper than it's ever been before. Uh, it's still a significant investment, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah. But it's not renting the studio for a thousand bucks an hour anymore, and you know, getting scheduled six months out because the studio is booked. Uh, home studios, the rise of of audio equipment, um, has has made the job of narrating more accessible to to many narrators, uh, and it's driven the price of narration down quite a bit because. Uh, you're paying for the talent 
more than all the setup around it in the studio space and home studios are so much easier and, and cheaper to make for, for narrators as well. So it's a great time in the audiobook industry with a ton of potential for even more growth in the next couple of years. Mm. Yeah. A um, couple things. One, if folks look at the uh, Alex Newton presentation, he has a slide where he shows, I think it's over a one or two year period of how, uh, in the different genres, uh, print is just getting devoured by ebooks and more so um, by audiobooks. Yes. That, um, this is the picture I also showed in, in Vegas where we looked at the, the, the top 100 bestsellers on Amazon are not print bestseller lists, they are book bestseller lists, they are cross format. So if you go through them, you even find Kindle books on there. Who, who, which don't even have a print edition. So you can, for every genre, like romance, for example, 93% uh, of the top 100 titles, not in the Kindle bestseller list, the book bestseller list of Amazon are actually Kindle editions that are up there in the top 100. Um, for mystery, thriller, suspense, it's around three quarters of the bestseller list. So in literature and fiction, sci-fi, it's about 66%. So this is the penetration of a format in the top selling uh, part of the market, which is really generating the revenue, the top 100s, right? Right. So, right. so just before we even go into the details, look at this. This is the format share in 2017, and this is the format share in 2018. You go back once more, 2017, 2018. Well, I see two things. I see the red area growing, which is Kindle editions, and I see the blue area growing, mm. which is audio, right? So, and the green, the, the blue the, area. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's crazy. The, the blue area is the one where the traditional publishers and, and the indies agree, or this data, Amazon data agrees. Also, the traditional publishers, if you look at their numbers, going back here once more, um, the blue is their audiobooks, and they now represent also 500 million in sales, million dollars, and it grew by 37% in the last year. So I think that is something, at least something, the, the industry agrees on all across the board. Mm. So the, the choices for people in those, in those different genres, the, the, he's actually broken that out, and you can see how how fast it's accelerating in certain genres and really it, the like you said that it's what's eating up print is not ebooks it's audio yep yep um before one thing before we get into um kind of the marketplace and like the different players one thing i think would be interesting maybe for you to touch on because i know you have insight into this is if you could talk a little bit about the narrator community and what's going on in, in their world, because, um, you know, I just finished working on an audiobook through find away voices. I found my, my narrator through that your company. Mm -hmm. And as that relationship developed, I discovered how there's this, this narrator ecosystem out there that's similar to like the indie author community. It is. Yeah. It's very tight knit. People talk, people share resources. It's a very sharing community, uh, very tight knit. There's lots of, you know, just like there are lots of private Facebook groups for authors, there's lots of private Facebook group for narrators and they're sharing their experiences with all the different platforms, with all the different authors. And, and they're sharing a lot of marketing techniques too. I, I think an often overlooked uh, part of audiobook marketing is, is how integral the narrator is to the listener's experience and how they can actually be pushing sales. So there, you know, there's a surprising, mm -hmm. to, it was surprising to me when I first learned it. Maybe it's not surprising to you, but there is a lot of narrators out there who have their own followings. People know the kind of books that this narrator chooses to narrate. They love their voice and their performance. They say, I don't care who wrote it. I'm listening to anything that person reads. You know, you hear the, the you know, read me the phone book. I love your <laughs> book. Like, it's actually true that people are very, very, um, devout followers of these narrators and that can be a huge tool for you when you're marketing your audiobook. Um, so, so a little bit more about the narrator community. You know, we work with about 2,500 narrators uh, on our system. There are lots and lots of narrators out there with uh, an enormous amount of talent. 
Uh, right now, audiobooks are all human narrated. These are all human performances. They are not, you know, licensing their voice uh, to some other tool. This is humans doing real work, uh, and it is grueling work in the studio, mm. right? If you think about, uh, you know, the amount of talking that we are going to do in this next hour is nothing compared to the amount of talking that a narrator is doing in a day of recording. Mm. And most people underestimate the stress it takes on your voice to talk nonstop for, for four, six, eight hours a day, you know, and you need your voice to sound the same at the beginning of that day as it is at the end of that day. And so these people are real pros. They have all kinds of tips and rituals and, and ways to keep their voice fresh and know exactly how many breaks to take. And, uh, you know, they're all independent contractors as well, uh, at least the ones that work with Findaway Voices. Uh, so they set their own rates. They know exactly uh, what kind of projects they want to work on. They know um, how many hours a day they can work, and they want to book up, you know, as much work as possible uh, for the foreseeable future. So, uh, yes. So, so just one of the questions, and this is kind of a, more of a kind of personal thing in going through the process with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so, you you asked a bunch of questions and then yeah. you suggested five, five or six narrators yeah. that, that I could choose from that had little snippets that I could listen to. C can you kind of get in that process and like how is, is that right, how very, you find can, the right narrator? Yeah, the yeah. yeah. That seems to be a pretty intensive process. It is. Yeah. And this is one of the big values that we try to bring to authors in our platform. So, um, when you go uh, through Findaway Voices to create your audiobook, we do ask you a bunch of questions at the beginning. It's like a big dating profile, right? We're like, what, you know, is it male or female? What does the voice sound like? How does it make you feel? We're asking some really like simple questions like, is the voice male or female? And then some more emotional questions and getting a feel for what you picture the audiobook being. And then we use a human casting team. Like we have 2,500 narrators. It's impossible to know what each of them sounds like and keep it in our head, right? So we have, it's a mixture of art and science. You see you need a male narrator. Okay, now half the list is, is, is whittled on, down. Yeah. And we whittled it down to usually, uh, you know, our casting team is working with 50 to 100 narrators at the, the end of the automated process. And then they take what they know about the narrators. They listen to the samples. They pre-vet it. They read all of the questions that you answer. <laughs> Believe me, none of those questions that you answer are just thrown away. Like we use all of that data. Mm. And then our casting team decides, here are the five or six, maybe up to 10 narrators we think would be the best fit for your particular project. Um, so it's not an open marketplace. This is because you can sort through them. You can filter through them. You can spend all day or all week listening to all these samples. And there is a lot more uh, freedom in that experience sometimes when you have control. But with Find Away Voices, we kind of zoom you right to the semifinal round. So you're not mm -hmm. overwhelmed with 80,000 choices. You have five or six that are vetted by our our experienced casting team. Mm. We have a lot of authors that come to us and tell us, I've never listened to an audiobook. How can I be expected to know what a good narrator sounds like? Mm. That's where our process works really well for first time authors or first time, you know, audiobook productions where you don't know exactly what you're looking for. We do this all day long and you can trust our experts to find a performer that is a really good match for your book. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, in, in my process, um, like I said, I was five or six, you threw over the wall. Um, there was two that I found really good. And then what I did in my process was I went out to my readers and asked them. Okay. And, um, you know, which was interesting because more than 50% that wrote back, it was about just their distaste for audiobooks, right? Like they, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I understand there's, there's some people that are really purist about the reading experience and I get that. Mm -hmm. But then what was interesting was um, the feedback that I got for um, overwhelming was towards one of the narrators. It wasn't the one that I thought was the better one. So, uh, you know, I, I made the choice to like, like, well, my family says this and all my readers say this, so it's probably better that I go with, what they think is the right answer then. I love that. You're, you're clearly a good marketer because you took your own bias out of the decision and you have the data make the decision for you. Yeah. And yeah. I, I love that. So, so the one thing we, we skipped over this a little bit, but from those five or six narrators, you chose two to audition. Yes. Meaning they read the actual snippet from your book. 
So you can hear your words in their voice. Yes. And that's yes. what you went to your readers to with, yes. right? Yeah. Then I sent yeah. those samples out and I, and I specifically picked, um, uh, pieces that had multiple voices in it, yep. male and female, because, um, and I, I think that was the other thing where, uh, this one, uh, the Anna Clements, who's a person I chose, um, demonstrated was that's something that she's very talented at doing right yep. now. Now in retrospect, after listening through all the work that she's done, because I'm in that process. Yeah. I, I feel really bad as an author because it's like, all these accents and men and it's like, you know, you don't think about it when you're writing it. Like how back to your point about being a narrator, it's conveying that story as a narrator and voicing characters. It's, it's yeah, that's hard, hard work. And when it's done, like I believe my books are better audio way better yeah. with her reading them than the stuff I write. Like it just captures something that I don't, I don't think I, I get just as a, a traditional author. That's I love me. that. There's a couple things I want to unpack there because yeah, there's ahead, some really insights in what you just said. One, you know, a lot of, a lot of first time authors believe that if I have two main characters, a male and a female in my book, I need two narrators, but it's actually very uncommon. It's, it's more common for one narrator to perform both the male and the female voices. And that's something I think you found out with Anna that, that she does really, really well. And a lot of narrators are, you know, they do this all the time. They are, they are pros and they know how to do that. So it's also way more expensive if you use two narrators than one, because then you, you know, these two people are not in the same room. you got to make the audio sound like it was recorded in the same room. Mm. There's a lot more editing. It can get really expensive. And it's not what listeners are used to listening to. They're used to one performer doing everything. So, so that was a really good insight. Second, I've heard so many authors say that listen at going through the audiobook experience has changed the way they write. So mm -hmm. when you're listening to some of these passages, you're, you're, you're telling yourself, Oh my gosh, why did I do that to poor Anna? <laughs> <laughs> and I bet you the next time you write your book, you know, especially if it's in the same series, you're going to yep. hear her voice as you're writing and you're going to start writing to the performance. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love that. And I, I, I hear that all the time. So it really, it can make you a better writer in, in a lot of ways by having that. Absolutely. And then, and then back, back to the audition process, because I just wanted to hit on this, because I think what you did was so brilliant to, to take the two auditions and, and send it out to your audience. And when you left it up to a vote, there's a couple of things that happen. One, you take, take your own bias out of it, because you're not, you're not the one buying this audiobook. It's mm -hmm. your listeners and your readers. And so you want to do what makes them the happiest. Uh, and you don't always, you think you can intuit that, but you don't always choose the right one as you, as you found out. And second, every single person who voted for Anna is like an instant purchase, right? They are from before the audiobook existed, they are personally invested in the outcome of this and they feel like they had a part in the production process. So I think that's, that's brilliant marketing, brilliant tactics to get them involved and feel like part of the process from the very beginning. And then, you know, not only are they going to buy, but they're going to tell their friends like, yeah, I, I was the one who helped pick that narrator. Mm, yeah. Well, <laughs> so and, they're, they're going to talk about it. Yeah, and in, in the case of how I did my um, production where I use Kickstarter, you know, there's 53 people that paid enough money that they're going to get their name read in the credits. So they're, yeah. like, going to get that little bit of joy, too. Yep. Uh, this is kind of a si an aside, but um, I'd be interested if you have any insight into this before we kind of get back into the economics. So, like, sure. um, really kind of tactical and totally performing personally. Um, and thinking about like the end matter of an audio book, like, so mm -hmm. most indies are really understand how you can use that end matter to sell the next book yep, or to get that person to join on to an, a mailing list. What have you seen authors do in their audio books to use kind of the ending credits to, to win over that reader into their, their audience? Great question. Great question. So I see a couple of things that I think are really effective and have, have gotten really good responses from audiences, which is one, especially, especially if you're using a narrator uh, and not self narrating to have the author come on and do the author's note in their own voice. Don't have the narrator perform that piece, but make it really personal and explain, Hey, I'm the author here. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the process and my next book and 
what I was thinking, like the author's notes are so impactful in eBooks, but I to make that. that, give them an extra layer of personality by bringing in your own voice, it's going to be a shock because they just listened to, you know, 10 hours of this, this other voice. And then you come in and the audio is probably not as good. It still needs to be up to standard, but there's going to be a, a difference in that audio, but you can use that to your advantage to make it a really personal connection. Uh, you know, the, the spoken word can give such a more emotional connection than the written word uh, in these kind of instances that you can use that to your advantage. Second, I see a lot of authors when book two is done, taking a chapter or even the entire first chapter and tacking that onto book one and saying, hey, I hope you enjoyed the book. It's over now. Listen to an excerpt of book two right here and get them hooked on that. So this is something you got to, you know, as you're going through the series and you get book two produced, you need to extract that little piece, go back to book one, insert it in, make sure that there's an introduction for it so it doesn't just start. <laughs> you're, you know, you're selling it. But if you know that that's coming, you can have the narrator record those, those bumpers, those pieces in between to set each piece up uh, ahead of time. And then you can just be ready when that book comes out. But giving people a little sample of book two, you know, this is a, a lot of these are things that work in the ebook world already. And we're just kind of stealing the. <laughs> yeah, that's great, right? But it, it does, it's not any less valuable in the, in the audiobook world. So uh, that's another thing that I see a lot from authors. Um, trying to think, I had a third one in my head. <laughs> now I've lost it. But those are, those, are, those are two good ones that I've seen a lot of, a lot of authors leverage. Okay. Well, if you think about it, we can always just jump back in with it. Um, okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, no, that's really helpful because like the, just the thought of like me coming in with the, the author's notes and just kind of riffing on that, I think is, is a great idea and helps warm up um, that audience. Yeah. Um, okay. So we were, we were, we, you, you, we kind of went over big, big market. It's fastest growing part of this kind of way of getting your intellectual property out there. Um, can you kind of go into like, there's you guys and all the other competitors, how do they all kind of fit? And Sure. Yeah. There's a bunch of different ways to get your audiobook made. One, um, you can get picked up by a publisher, go to the traditional route. And when you do sell your rights to a publisher, they you generally eat the production costs. They will, if they buy your audio rights and they decide to exercise them, the publisher will be in charge of paying for that audiobook production. Uh, you will have varying degrees of control in that process. Uh, anything from zero control uh, to maybe you get to make final call on the narrator that they choose and make sure that you're okay with it um, and everything in between. So when you sell your rights, uh, your audio rights, make sure that if there's something that's really important to you, like, I want to make sure that the cover art matches my ebook or uh, I want final control over the, the narrator that's chosen. Make sure that's in the contract ahead of time. Okay. Um, you can self-publish and do it yourself. And if you do that, there's two main ways that you can um, kind of go through that process. And that's with Findaway Voices, which is us, or ACX, which is uh, Audible's self-publishing arm. So we're the two, the two main players in the industry. ACX works as an open marketplace where you post your project and there's a bunch of narrators, and you um, you can go two routes. One, you can pay outright for your production, mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk in a second about how audiobooks are 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 billed based on the per finished hour rate. But you can pay outright for your production, which means you match up with a narrator, you get the book, and at the end you still own the book. Um, you can distribute it wide, you can distribute it exclusive. There's a couple different options there, which we'll get into. But you own the book. The other way with ACX is to do what's called a royalty share which means you pay nothing up front for the audiobook, and the narrator performs it and then splits the royalties with you for seven years uh, exclusively on ACX. So that means uh, you're only reaching Audible, Amazon, and iTunes or Apple Books now. Mm -hmm. And when those royalties come in, you're splitting them 50-50 with the narrator for seven years. So mm -hmm. the narrator takes the, the initial risk, they do the upfront investment, and they share an ongoing um, split of the royalties. Uh, you cannot pull your book from that exclusivity contract. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to the narrator who did all the work up front. So you are locked in for seven years on that platform. Uh, right now, they are the biggest platform, so it's not uh, the worst choice in the world to make, but the, the audiobook market is changing and evolving at a really fast rate. Uh, and if you, I think if you look at just the last two years, uh, signing a contract for seven years is a pretty risky proposition right now. Yeah. So, um, the, you know, the way audiobooks work with Findaway Voices 
is again, you can pay upfront that per finished hour rate. And when you're done, you completely own the audiobook uh, and you can do whatever you want with it. So we have the same kind of setup there. The big difference in our process is the casting team, which we talked about earlier, which is we're going to help you help guide you towards who we think the perfect narrator is for your book. Uh, but at the end, you still have the audiobook files. You still know all the metadata, you, whatever you want with it. You don't have to distribute through us. You can take it uh, and go exclusive on Audible if you want, or you can do whatever. You can sell it on CDs in the back of your car. I don't care. <laughs> like, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, we also announced kind of a hybrid royalty share, uh, which is not available for authors yet, but is coming in a couple months. And the way this works is you pay half up front for your audiobook. Um, so instead of $2,000 for the production, you're paying $1,000. And then you're splitting the royalties, a smaller portion of the royalties with the narrator for 10 years. Um, and the there's a couple benefits here. One, there's a defined buyout option. So if you don't like this deal, you can buy out and just completely take your audiobook and now you own it. There's, a, mm -hmm. there's an easy path to get out. So we don't want to lock you in. Two, when you go through Find Away Voices, you're reaching 33 retailers across the world and we're adding more retailers all the time. So you're not locked into one platform where all your listeners go to buy your book. You're on 33 different platforms, including Audible. So we're not, you know, you're still on Audible, which is the biggest, but you're mm -hmm. also getting the benefit of being in libraries, both public libraries and school libraries, if that's something that's important to your genre, subscription platforms, international uh, retailers, the big names like Apple and Google and Kobo. You know, your audiobook is everywhere that people are searching for it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's a smaller cut of the royalties. So, uh, you know, the way it works when an audiobook sells on Find Away Voices is we gather up all these royalties from 33 different partners uh, and all different business models. And there's this, this lump of payments that's your royalties and you keep 80% of that and find a way voices keeps 20%. Mm -hmm. So if you do the royalty share, you keep 60%, the narrator keeps 20% and find a way voices keeps 20%. So it's uh, it's a pretty good deal for the authors. And we're really excited to roll that out as another way uh, to cut down that initial investment of making an audiobook. Mm -hmm. No, it, 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 it makes sense. And then, you know, I don't want As you can see, there's a lot of complexity <laughs> in yeah, the industry. And like, there, there's a lot of choices and a lot of places that you can go to make your audiobook, to sell your audiobook. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I, I hope I'm doing a good job at simplifying it. But there is there's a lot to wrap your head around with this. So if you're overwhelmed, don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah, and it, it is, there's, um, there, it, it impacts quality too, right? Because I don't want a bad mouth royalty share at all but you can imagine that higher quality more demand narrators don't need to play that game mm -hmm. right like they they can um they can command a certain amount of money per hour finished hour and they just kind of want to do their thing and go right they're not yeah. looking for or the opposite, which is just like we were talking, uh, you know, about earlier about the studios doing their homework. Uh, the narrators do their homework too, and some of the best narrators will look through ACX to find the royalty share projects that they think will return way more money than if the author had just mm. paid outright. And so, if a narrator is really aggressively asking you to do a narrator or a royalty share, you as the author should think twice about that That's because clearly that narrator sees a lot of potential in your book and you might better off just paying out right for the production. Um, because <laughs> those, if a narrator is, is asking for this, uh, to do work for free, like yeah, not, yeah. these are good people too, right? <laughs> yeah. Like if you're like, wow, this is, this is, it's this is an amazing narrator that's done all these sci-fi books and I'm in sci-fi and they're calling me, they're sending me emails. It's like, maybe it's time to scrape up the money. Right. Yeah, they're interested for a reason, for sure. Yeah. Which may not be bad. I, I think that they're... Um, not always bad, no, absolutely. Right? Like, if, if you think about, you know, one of the things that I, I like to talk about with um, uh, folks that watch the show and just authors, it's, it's about finding different ways to get audiences, just like you can go to crowdfunding to find audiences there. If this is a really super popular narrator, they have a following... You know, they can bring a, a portion of their audience that never heard of you, right? And they're going to they're be like, they, and they would never buy your books either. But because you're with <laughs> them, the, right. they are audiobook listeners, they're going to now, and like, wow, this is a really good story that my favorite narrator is reading. Yep. Yep. And, absolutely. Right. So. All right, I want to circle back just for a second to sure. explain how audiobooks are, are billed. And when you pay up front for the audiobook, what does that mean? 
and and I think I, 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 I spit out the jargon a little bit, the PFH, right, per finished hour, but I want to explain what that is and, and how it works. So the, the cost of an audiobook production is based on two things, the length of your audiobook and the per finished hour rate of the narrator that you choose. So a 10 hour audiobook is going to cost more than a one hour audiobook. It's going to cost okay. 10 times more <laughs> because, because if this is taking the narrator's time to record this. The narrator charge is on a per finished hour rate. So this, this ranges, you know, we see most narrators on our platform within the $150 to $300 per finished hour. We do see some, uh, you know, it goes all the way up to $800 or $1,000 per finished hour. But those, are, those are really top tier upper crust, uh, awesome narrators. And, and the vast majority is $150 to $300 per finished hour. So let's call it $200 so that we can do some easy math here. Like that. And then, and then uh, so you multiply that $200 per finished hour times the length of your book. So if you're thinking in word count, the easy way to think of it is 10,000 words is about an hour of audio. So if you have a 100,000 word book, uh, you're looking at a 10 hour audio book times $200. You're looking at $2,000 for that investment. Uh, and this is the option on both ACX and Find Away Voices where you pay up front and you get the file and you own it completely, you know, when you're done. Um, and that $2,000 means the narrator generally takes between two and five hours to record a single finished hour of audio. So they're going to read the book. They're going to make a mistake. They're going to back up. They're going to reread it. They're going to splice in the new take with the old take and then do all the editing and mastering at the end so that what you're left with is a book that's ready for every retailer in the world. It's up to their quality standards. All of the technical aspects are taken care of and it's edited and polished and ready to go. So there's, when these books are delivered, there's nothing else that you need to do. You have a finished product. So uh, I just want to explain the, the per finished hour is kind of a lingo thing and it's not always clear um, that it's not a one-to-one, -one, that the, mm. the narrator doesn't just go blah, 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 and I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. here's your finished product. It, it's, it's a really grueling process that takes a lot of time. So you, you said it like for every finished hour, it's like five hours work. Of it, it's like a good narrator is about three hours of work, two to three hours of work for a finished hour, a really good narrator. And then some of, some of the um, narrators that are earlier in their career and are still working through the kinks in the process, it can be three to five hours of work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you find that you've misspoken a, a common word throughout the whole book and you have to go back and re-record every time you said that word, like uh, that's a huge time sink and it's not a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, the more experience you have does translate into better, uh, better multiples of that, that hours to finished hours. Mm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So that, that's the pay up, up front factor. Yes. That's your, your, it's inclusive of the narrator's time to read the book as well as the editing and. It's all baked into that per finished hour rate. Yeah. So you can say, I know my book's going to be about 10 hours and you can do the math and Basically, any audiobook that's made in the whole industry is billed that way. Okay. Yeah. So why don't we talk a little bit about like business models that the different booksellers have and the different booksellers and kind of how you're, I know you, like you said, you're kind of an aggregator. So you yep. have relationships with, I guess, all of them. I mean, yeah. Yeah. 33 retailers all across the world. They're not just based in the U.S. There's some really cool global players um, and lots of different business models and innovation in the industry right now. So let's start with Audible because this is the one everybody knows. They have, they have grown the market so much and they have done so much for the popularity of audiobooks. Uh, and there's some real great benefits to the way they sell audiobooks and some huge drawbacks for certain corners of the market. So the way Audible works, you probably know this already, is a, a credit subscription model. So the vast majority of audiobooks that are sold on Audible you pay 15 bucks a month and you get this credit. And then you can exchange that credit for any audiobook in their, in their platform. So, um, you know, this is a subscription model where you're uh, not as price conscious on the retail price of the audiobook, but you are conscious of the value that you're getting for this token. So I, I paid 15 bucks for this token. I'm exchanging it. Do I exchange it for the one hour audiobook or the 20 hour audiobook, right? You're always going to choose the one that takes up the most time. Uh, generally speaking, and because of this, it's hurt shorter form audiobooks. So the the two to three to four hour audiobooks, shorter form content has always kind of struggled on Audible to find a footing. Um, also, because you can't set your price on Audible, so you have no uh, control as an author as to what Audible decides to show your list price for. 
And if your list price is under $15, which is what people pay for that credit, it's going to hurt you. And it's generally based on, it's based on a lot of factors, <laughs> uh, but, but generally the length of your audiobook is going to be the biggest determining factor there. So um, we'll talk more about shorter content and what platforms that's doing really well on later. But the so opposite of that is just is one question, bundled. Yeah, yeah, one question on that. So like if I, if I'm with find a way and I put my book in there, I know I can set my price there. Uh, no, I, I so, find a way, but they're, but they're going to well, explain what you're going to say. Sure. So one of the great things that we do at find a way voices is let you set your list price. So mm -hmm. the list price is what you, you know, if you see a 40% royalty rate or a 45% royalty rate and you set your list price at $10, you know, every time that book sells, you're going to make four fifty, right? Okay. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the retailer wants to sell it at. If they want to discount it to $2 and take a loss on every sale, they can do that. They want to bump it up to $20 and, and jack up their margin. They can do that. But you know, if you're pushing advertising to a platform, exactly what you're going to make is based on your list price. And that applies for almost every retailer that we distribute to the, the exception being audible. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they do not accept a list price from authors. Uh, they're going to sell it for whatever they decide to sell it for. So okay. you don't have control over audible, uh, and the list price there. That's the one major exception. It's good. It's good to know. I know one of my clients that I work with who's just been investing a lot in audiobooks and um, kind of got a shock. Yeah, because it's right. like the, the, this this wasn't the royalty I thought I was going to be getting. They went, of course, direct. Mm -hmm. And it, I guess that that's the essence of what it is: is that they're kind of being told what the book's going to sell for. Exactly. Yeah. So, and there's two royalty rates at Audible. This is a, the other notable thing. So. If you decide to go exclusive with Audible, meaning you cannot sell your book anywhere outside of the Audible ecosystem, you'll make 40% royalty rate. If you want to go wide and use, you know, sell your book on Audible, but also be somewhere else, then you make 25% royalty rate. Okay. Uh, and and we, we explain that as it's 25% of whatever Audible decides to sell it for. And that's just the easiest way to think about it, which is you don't have the control over that like you do at other retailers. Mm -hmm. And they're a huge retailer. You know, I... It, it, it doesn't sound that attractive, the, the setup, but I still would not recommend you not going to Audible uh, because they're a huge player in the market. But you just need to understand the framework that you're working in there mm. and, say, and say, so this is the opposite of the short, short content problem there. There's a huge opportunity on Audible for your bundles, for your omnibuses, for taking your books one through five series and jamming them all into one package that's going to be 20 hours long. It's going to look really attractive to somebody uh, trading in their credit the length of it's going to bump up your, your list price based on what Audible decides to sell it for, and mm -hmm. you can make a much better royalty there. So, so longer content, bundled content, series, uh, series bundles and omnibuses do really well at Audible. And that's kind of the flip side. That's why when you know how the market works for each retailer, you can start to be really strategic about making sure that you absolutely need a bundle on Audible. Yeah. Well, uh, and and I, don't miss that opportunity. Yeah, and, that, and uh, another point on that, um, I know an author that um, is writing in a particular genre. They've got a three book series. It's doing really well. They got picked up by um, Audible for some of their, their um, promotional stuff. Okay. And, and it, it, they made a ton of money from that promotion and it pulled all their book sales up too. Yeah. So they're, but they, this is somebody that has invested a lot of money to get, I think it's three books. Um, and that's the only thing that's really the, the product, right? And it's just because of what right. you said that, you know, for that credit, it's it's a worthwhile enterprise. Yeah, absolutely. And and believe me, if you get blessed by the Audible gods and get on a carousel or on the front page or get really heavily merchandised, it is a huge windfall. Like they have an enormous reach. They're really good at mobilizing their audience and getting people to notice your book. But increasingly, they are, they are investing in their own productions. They're doing the Audible Originals. They're doing Audible Studios. They have books that they are also producing that they're very invested in making a return on. Mm. And so it's, it's a, they're, they're a publisher and a retailer. You are competing for those, those spots on their website with them. Uh, and that's an increasingly hard spot to be in for authors when you're competing against your own retailer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Unless you have any other questions about no, Audible. no, that's it. Like keep keep your keep on track. Cool. Okay, so so you know the Audible does the credit subscription model. They also do. You can just pay outright for a book, but it's much less popular. 
So let's move on to that next. That's called a la carte sales, which means I pay you a bit of money and I get a license to that audiobook. This is the, you know, essentially buying an audiobook. And there's mm -hmm. a bunch of big players that operate this way. So Apple Books uh, operates this way, Google Play operates this way. Kobo has both a credit subscription model and an a la carte purchase option. And, and all of these places uh, do accept list prices. So if you have a really short piece of content, you can price it at $199, $299, $399 and make it really attractive uh, to buyers to, to make it an impulse buy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and generally speaking, we see the, the list price that you set it at be pretty close or exactly to the sale price of the retailers. There's not, you know, there's not price matching in audiobooks right now. There's not a whole lot of sophistication uh, with the algorithms on pricing. So it's not a guarantee when you set your list price to $10 that Apple is going to sell it for $9.99. Uh, but you know what your, your royalty is going to be when you do that. So mm -hmm. it makes it really easy to know I'm going to run an ad campaign. I know my cost of customer acquisition has to be $4.50 or less. And I can run ads all day long against a particular retailer uh, and know what the return's going to be on mm -hmm. that. So uh, another way, uh, a big, really popular way to sell audiobooks is through a subscription model or a cool model. So this is, think of it Netflix for audiobooks, right? Okay. So there's a bunch of players that are doing this. Listeners pay a monthly fee, like eight bucks or 10 bucks a month, and they get access to a huge catalog of audiobooks. So Scribd, High Books, Playster, um, Storytel, all big ones, uh, big players in that market. Uh, Storytel being a, an enormous player internationally. Uh, actually, let's let's talk about them for a little bit because okay. story. Have you heard of Storytel? I have not. No. Okay, so Storytel is out of Scandinavia, and they they did a really interesting thing. They're kind of following the Audible playbook in that they're really aggressively buying up rights. They are producing their own content, original content, uh, but they're they're operating on a subscription model with this kind of all you can eat, all you can listen model, which is really attractive, really attractive to big listeners who just want to mm -hmm. power through a bunch of books. And they're out of Scandinavia. They're targeting countries that Audible doesn't have a presence in. So they're not competing with Audible. And they're going to these white space, these blue ocean markets that don't have existing digital reader markets. Like, uh, you know, when they entered Scandinavia and when they're entering Latin America, they're, they're targeting these places that are primarily print book focused still. And more and more people have cell phones in their pockets. They're ready for the convenience of digital books. And when you have a cell phone as your consumption device, are you going to choose an, reading an ebook on that tiny little screen or are you going to choose listening mm -hmm. to an audiobook? The audiobook, they're, they're creating these audio first markets mm -hmm. where they're not necessarily competing against ebook. They're building a digital market in these regions that is all audiobook focused. So, you know, with the US, you think of print and then ebooks and then audiobooks last. Mm -hmm. These consumers are thinking about audiobooks first and they're seeing massive, massive success in these regions. So we just launched with Storytel in December. Uh, we're really excited uh, about the potential uh, in non-U.S. markets and really, really uh, fast-growing regions. So th their uh, playbook is really smart. Yeah, yeah it, that is interesting. The question I would have is, do you have any data or understanding of, you know, how many of those markets, like what's the size of those that are English-speaking markets? Oh, great question. Yeah, so a lot of the content that comes through Find Away Voices is English speaking content, uh, though not all of it. We accept language, you know, any language content doesn't matter to us. Uh, we'll distribute all of it. But mm -hmm. yes, the vast majority of what we get is English language content. And English, uh, English language audiobooks are insanely popular for English as a second language customers. Mm. So, you know, compared to print where you are sitting down and you're doing a lot of work, this is um, sitting back and listening to an English language audiobook is much easier to be entertainment. Uh, like having a TV on uh, with a French French movie to learn French by immersing mm -hmm. yourself. This is kind sure. of the, the same analog to that in other countries where they're using English language audiobooks as a more passive entertainment and uh, comprehension tool, uh, as well as, you know, English is the most popular second language uh, for many, many countries. So there are English speakers in a lot of these countries, and there's not a whole lot of native language audiobooks to choose from. So they are reaching for English language content. English language content is insanely popular uh, in a lot of markets where English is not the primary language. Uh, and that's just kind of the way that the audiobook market has evolved from, uh, you know, the U.S. publishers out. And mm. there's just not a whole lot of, uh, uh, of, of 
you know, I don't want to say foreign language, but non-US, uh, non-English content out there to choose from. So they reach for the English language content because there's more choice there. And that conditions them to listen to those types of books, which gives, you know, authors a huge opportunity in markets like India or Latin America or Scandinavia, mm -hmm. where you might not see as much traction with your eBooks, uh, but audiobooks are much easier to just kick back and, and have passive entertainment with. Well, and you, you, you mentioned that market. Now, there may be issues with what they want to read, but you talk about India. There's more college-educated English speakers in India than there is in all of the United States. Yep. Right? Like, yep. so as far as a market... Um, huge potential. Huge. huge. Billions. Yeah, yeah, billions. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, uh, I see all of the explosive growth in the next five years coming from not the U.S. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, the U.S. is, is uh, providing a lot of the... The revenue for authors right now in terms of engagement and sales, but all of the explosive growth that the audiobook market is going to see is going to be in places like India, Latin America, Scandinavia, uh, all of these other regions that are uh, even Africa. You know, StreetLib is doing some interesting stuff in Africa, opening up hyper regionalized pricing for every country in Africa to make sure that the audiobooks are priced specifically right for mm. them. Right. Like we're thinking big Mac index kind of stuff here. I know your listeners are business people, yeah. <laughs> but like, like nine 99 for an audiobook in the U S is okay. But that could be a month's wages in some other countries. Like you can't price your audiobook the same everywhere or else you're just not going to make any sales. It's not going to be competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, so retailers are starting to get really smart about that. And audiobooks are starting to t get a lot of traction in those markets. Interesting. So, um, is there any other, uh, kind of interesting, yeah the, other, yeah, the other really big one that a lot of people uh, discount, uh, but is, is huge, is libraries. Okay. Uh, so public libraries, school libraries, university libraries, you know, um, there's two ways uh, to sell your book into libraries. And one is the traditional way where a librarian finds your book, they say, yes, I want this in my catalog, I'm going to buy it. And they pay two to three X what the retail price is so that they can circulate it. Mm -hmm. And then they circulates just like, you know, how you expect it to be in a library as if it was a physical device It can be checked out to one person at a time and Then they have to return it and then the next person can buy it If you have a lot of demand for your book libraries don't like long hold lines So they might buy two or three copies of your book um, This is we're seeing um, a, a little bit of a resurgence in this model for indie authors when they are uh, Targeting local libraries and doing the phone calls and saying hey, I'm a local author uh, I'd like for you to carry my book or mobilizing their audience to ask the librarians to mm. carry it um, because it is a big payday when you make one of these sales because you can sell it for two to three times what your normal price is. Um, but traditionally librarians are looking at the big publications. They're looking at content that people are, you know, is the most marketed from the biggest publishers and that's the content that wins, which is why there's a second model that is really interesting for, for indies and self-published authors to think about. So there's a paper circulation model. And this essentially mirrors the Netflix experience within a library. So okay. instead of convincing a librarian to carry your book, your book is just in the catalog by default for anybody that uses this model. Uh, and so Hoopla is the big one on this. Uh, Overdrive has uh, this model. Some of the, I see all of the big library players moving to this within a couple of years because it gives the freedom of unlimited choice to the library patrons where they're searching through the entire catalog. They're going to find your book. And when they download it, then the library pays a fee. And the library can cap their daily, monthly, yearly fees so that they can cost control. And, you know, you might run out of listens for a day or something mm -hmm. like that and say, come back tomorrow to listen. But this lets you do some direct-to-patron marketing, which is really, really powerful because, you know, I know you, you love marketing too, and I, I, I love it. And one of the best messages you can say is, it's free for you, and I get paid when you listen. Mm. <laughs> like, this is a really powerful message to say, go to your local library, listen to it for free. You put your series starter on there. You put your, your bonus content on there. You get people drawn in from a whole new audience of library listeners that are then going to get hooked on your series. And maybe they'll continue through the library. Maybe they'll go buy it somewhere else. Um, but it's a great marketing message. And we're seeing more and more authors directly target library patrons. And the ones that are, are seeing 30% uh, 35% of their royalty check coming from library systems, which mm. is huge. And there's a lot of potential there to make a big impact. That's real interesting. And, and through find a way, if I, my books and find a way it accesses hoopla and those ones you've, you've said. Yeah, we have, I think, uh, 12 of the 33 
partners that we have are library systems. Okay. So these are, and this is not us selling directly to a library. This is us giving it to Hoopla, who mm -hmm. then has all the relationships with libraries or yeah. Biblioteca yeah. or Baker and Taylor. Yeah. yeah. So there is that, that there's another layer there. Yeah. No. And what I think is interesting about that, what you made me think about is, is that most authors who have a mailing list, you know, there's a large percentage of people that are sitting on that mailing list that um, don't buy their books. Yeah. Right? They've, they've got yep. it on there for free content. And there's a portion I know, like on my list that they can't, they, they can't afford books. They're on a fixed income. They're disabled. They've got issues. They are, they, they are fans, but they just don't have the money. So that's a great way to mobilize those people and educate them to say, Hey, not just for my books, but there's all these authors go and ask your life, you know, go check out Hoopla or go check out this thing. And, and, you know, by the way, while you're at the library, make sure my book's something you check out. Right. And if, yeah. if it's not, go ask the librarian about it. Yeah. And I know we, it's, it's huge. It's huge. It's a great way to mobilize your ebook. If this is your first audio book, right. And, um, you, you know, most of your audience on your mailing list are ebook focused people. They might not want to shell out 15 bucks a month to sign up for audible or shell out 19 bucks to buy it a la carte on some retailer. Mm -hmm. This can be a great way to dip their toe in the water and, help them realize how much they enjoy the format or the format's not for them and they move on, but they didn't lose any money trying it. It's a no risk way to use the public infrastructure yeah. uh, funding to, to, to fund your books. It's, it's fantastic. Well, and I know in our case of our, our library where I live just outside of Chicago, it's like you go in there and you ask them to get something. They've got a budget. They just go get it. They, they never use their budget. Right. <laughs> um, so they love, they love patron requests yeah. for sure. And they love featuring local content too. So, you know, Chicago public library, you should call them up and say, Hey, I'm a local author. Do you have any local author collections that you could feature me in? And mm -hmm. that, you know, it sounds small on the global stage, right? But it is another way for di discoverability is so hard and you need to be thinking about any way that you can have your books discovered. And the local author section is a fantastic way to start. And, and also, you know, the local author section does not have to be Chicago. It can be the State Library of Illinois. It can be mm -hmm. all of the Midwest, Midwest U.S., right? Like you can call up uh, Toledo or Detroit and say, hey, I'm a local author because I'm from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so think, think broadly about what local means in your context. Mm -hmm. um, local for a Seattle author could be anything from Portland to Vancouver, right? So <laughs> it, it, it's a big, big range with all those little library systems in between that could consider you local. Mm. So what other models are there that you um, that need to, we need to cover? I think those are the main ones, you know, uh, so that we covered credit subscription. We covered paying outright for the audiobook, the a la carte model. We called, we uh, did the subscription model, the all you can eat, the Netflix model. Uh, we did the library purchases and the library pay per listen models. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's basically it. There's some more smaller nuanced versions of the uh, subscription model as far as how the mechanics work. but to the listener, those are the main ways that you can buy an audio book. What about what you guys are doing with your direct sales? Sure. No, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about this. So this is um, something we've heard from the very beginning from a lot of authors that they want to be able to sell directly uh, to their customers. And there's a lot of tools that make this really a nice experience on the ebook side uh, for delivery to Kindle, to delivery to iPad. But on the audiobook side, they're a little bit more limited. And the, the people who are selling directly to their listeners are generally um, using a service that maybe helps them with the taxes a little bit, and then they're delivering an MP3 file. Mm -hmm. And the MP3 file will open up on your smartphone, and it will play, and it will be fine. But it's going to be a player that's geared towards music. And so, if, you know, you, you don't finish that today because it's a two-hour book and my commute's only 30 minutes. Well, when I open that file tomorrow, it's going to start me back at the beginning. I'm going to have to scrub to the middle, and it's just not a good experience, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we heard from authors again and again that there's two things they need solved for them to sell direct, the tech and the taxes. They need a good listening experience that's on par with the biggest retailers in the world so that they're not asking their audience to sacrifice the experience when they do this. Mm -hmm. And two taxes are a mess and they don't want to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, so that, taxes, just, that just got worse with Wayfair versus South Dakota now. And it's, it's complicated all over the world, right? It's yeah, not just yeah. the U.S. It's, you know, it's Brexit. It's all kinds of stuff that's making a lot of uncertainty and a lot of mm -hmm. um, uh, complications 
for, for taxes. So mm -hmm. we aim to solve this. Uh, it's, we have a platform called Authors Direct, and it's currently in private beta invite only, uh, though we're hoping to open it up more widely uh, within the next couple months, and then maybe completely wide by the end of the year. We're, we're moving slowly and cautious with, uh, with it so that we can make sure that everybody's having a really good experience. But mm -hmm. the way it works is we, um, we give you a storefront where you can sell your audiobook, and then we have two apps, an Android and an iOS app called Authors Direct. And it doesn't matter where, uh, which storefront that you buy an author's audiobook from. So I can buy from Joe's storefront, I can buy from my storefront, I can buy from a bunch of different ones. All of the audiobooks get delivered to one place, the Authors Direct app, which is a great listening experience. It's a world-class audiobook player. I use it all the time and love it. I'm a huge audiobook listener. Uh, I listen to 60 books a year and, and it's fantastic top of the line. So uh, it's not, you know, I don't have to go download Joe's app and then Will's mm. app and then Mary's app. Uh, mm. It's one app so that, and then once you're in the ecosystem, the, the next purchase is really easy. And then we give 85% uh, royalty rates. So we haven't talked a lot about the percentages in the audiobook industry. They are almost all lower than 50% uh, percent royalty rates. So 85% is a huge royalty rate that gives you a ton of potential for marketing. Uh, and you can calculate your ROI uh, really nicely on that for, for mm. ads. And um, so the 85% royalty rate um, combined with the great experience and the fact that we are the merchant of record for the sales. So we are uh, taking care of all the taxes as well. Uh, and this is another place where it, right now it's, it's available in the US, Canada, and Australia. And we're going to be opening up that up more broadly soon as well. Um, but Authors Direct is an interesting opportunity for authors uh, who are wide to sell their audiobooks uh, directly to consumers. Yeah, and I, I think that it's, it's, it's a nice solution from what I've seen of it and the authors that I've talked to that are on the platform that, um, you know, they, they're still responsible for doing the marketing. They've got to decide how they're going to go to market and, yep. you know, how they're driving people to that page. But once they get there, they don't have to deal with the product delivery or any of the tax nexus issues that come up. So that's really nice. Um, that's right. That's why we can offer an 85% royalty rate is because we're not acting like a normal retailer. We don't have a list of people that we are attracting. We are not running ads. There is not a whole lot of discoverability on the platform. You are responsible for driving the traffic to your page. And when you do, you are re rewarded with an incredible royalty rate for mm -hmm. it. Uh, and it's also a way for us to not look like a retailer. So all of the 33 partners we work with don't see us as a retailer yeah. because we're not acting like it, right? So it's a very different way. It's you, the author, are the one that the listener believes they are buying from. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the, the fulfillment we're just helping with and the taxes. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, I'd, I would assume it's similar with audiobooks. I know from my experience with direct sales on eBooks, um, there are customers that don't like to buy from certain big retailers. They have personal and political reasons why they don't want to do it. They're happy to tell you about it. Um, the giving them that option, um, is a way to, um, get them to, um, get a sale. You probably wouldn't get any other way. And more importantly, they're a direct customer. Like they, yep. they, with, with everything we see going on with, um, other retailers, you know, you, we, you alluded to it a little bit. It's like, you're kind of competing with guys. They're not sharing information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they have that on their side. Not only do they have their own sales information, they have your sales information <laughs> and they're selling against you, right? Like it's, it's not a yeah. level playing field. Whereas now doing things like this, is it going to replace all your sales that you would be doing through ACX? Probably not, but to have a chunk of business that is your own and know that it works, um, in case something happens that you yeah. have a place where you can continue to do your, your, your audio book. Um, yeah, sales. absolutely. And, and some of the things that I'm most excited about with authors direct is the level of control that we're giving authors as well. So you're not setting your list price, you're setting your sale price, right? Because you are, you are so closely connected to the storefront that if you want to discount your book for three days and, and have it marked down from $6.99 to $2.99, you can run that sale whenever you want to. You can generate coupon codes to give out to a certain number of fans to give them 20% off to make the book free. You, know, you can run all of these great promotions and have 
uh, the level of control that a retailer has yourself to help book, to market these books. So mm. uh, that's insanely powerful. And then we're starting to help um, with some experiments. So in February, we ran this uh, romance promotion. So we invited 20 romance authors to offer up their first in series book free through Authors Direct. And we made a new collection page with all of these 20 free books. Mm. And then each of the authors mobilized their audience to go get their book for free as part of this promotion. And they sent them to this collection page with the other 19 books as well. And so we saw all kinds of crossover from these 20 authors where, yes, I'm mobilized to go get this book, but then I see six others that I want. And now my cart has seven free books in it that are all series starters. Mm. I'm going to listen to a couple of those. I'm going to want book two, and I'm going to go back to authors direct to buy it. Mm. And we're seeing a lot of authors being able to pool their resources and pool their audience to help each other. And like, what other retailer is going to give you the opportunity to do that? Like, I am so excited about the potential for those kind of experiments on Authors Direct. And there was, it's still a little too early to see the results, but we're, I mean, we're starting to see the, the book two buy-throughs uh, happening on Authors Direct. And, it's, and it costs the, the authors, you know, nothing but offering a free book to participate in this, which is well, cool. it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant marketing strategy. If you're an author that knows that their read-through is, you know, I, I can't speak for my audiobooks. I don't have the series done. But let's say <coughs> it's the same as the read-through on my regular series. Well, that's, that's a really interesting prospect to get exposed to 19 other authors' mailing list because I know that there's above a 50% chance you're going to read my next book. Yep. Right? Uh, flip yeah, of the coin's pretty good marketing, right? Like, <laughs> and then I, what, if, if the coin comes up heads, I've got you. You're right. Because I know my read through so much higher on the, the two through whatever. And the beautiful thing is when you sell book two, even cheaper than it would be sold at, at a big retailer, you're making about double the royalty, which means you're making the same royalty as if book one and two sold on a different retailer. And then like you're broken even on that. And then yeah. books three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 are just, you know, icing on the top. Yeah. So it's really, it's, yeah, like you said, it's a really impactful uh, opportunity to, to leverage, you know, 19 other people's mailing list to get mm. people started on your series. Uh, and, you know, that was our first test with romance. I think those, there's some other genres coming and some more experiments that people can get in on uh, once we open Authors Direct a little wider. Well, sure. And I, you know, I know from what I've observed with like, um, I don't know if you know Chris Kennedy. Um, he's a sci-fi author, the Four Horsemen yep. series. Mm -hmm. So like what his anthologies do for those groups that get into those, you know, to, to land in his anthology could be a career maker. Yeah. Right? Um, yep. And it's, it, it, you know, he's got the cachet now where um, he can be really, really selective and they're just great stories. But, you know, it's a similar kind of idea is that if you're in a like genre um, with similar storytellers, um, the audience is just going to have a better affinity for your product and want to try it out. And, you know, the money you're saving on marketing is, is significant. It's significant. Yeah. 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 Um, what about, um, I know we got to wrap up here soon. Um, some other things that are happening in the marketplace like chirp and yeah. things that you're seeing that the, the indie authors should really know about and think about with how they can help their business. Sure. Yeah. There's, there's been two big announcements in just the last couple months that I'd love to talk about a little bit. One is Apple books. So Apple books is, um, you know, Apple books from the very beginning of the last 15 years has gotten their entire catalog from audible. And just recently, they have stopped using Audible as their exclusive provider. Audible is still providing a lot of audiobooks to them, but they've opened up their ecosystem to allow other preferred partners uh, to send them audiobooks to sell. And so Findaway Voices uh, and Findaway, uh, the company that we, you know, we're absorbed in, is a, uh, a preferred <laughs> partner of Apple Books, meaning we have a direct path to get your audiobook on Apple Books. And so if you're going non-exclusive, you can get to Apple Books uh, with a 25% royalty rate through the Audible path where you don't get to set your list price. But okay. if you come to us for Apple Books, you get a 45% uh, uh, royalty rate instead of 25 and you get to set your list price. 
So it's a huge opportunity for authors to just make a lot more money. If you're wide, there's no reason why you shouldn't do this. Uh, there is no catch. There is no hook. <laughs> like if you send your audiobook both ways, Apple realizes that you're getting a better royalty rate through us and they will delete the duplicate where you make less money. Mm. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for authors to know about if you are wide or if you've been waiting for the right moment to go wide, this might be it where you can get 20% more on your sales through Apple books and reach, you know, 33 retailers. Well, uh, so that was really exciting. And in December that launched. That's great. And I would assume that like to load an audio book, if you were going to go direct to Apple, it's through like producer and all that stuff. Uh, there is no way to upload your audiobook directly to Apple right now. Oh, there so isn't. The old, so it's not, the they don't even give you a horrific experience. No. <laughs> it's, it's just no. Okay. They all give right. you a fantastic experience <laughs> to find a way voices. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, no, that's, that's a good point to make because like, um, you know, we, um, you know, we've opted to use draft to digital just because um, uh, the fact that Apple to the direct process is just, it's super painful. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and that's actually a good point to make is that there's not for a lot of these retailers that we reach, there's not always a direct option to upload. So for some of them, you, you have to use an aggregator mm -hmm. uh, and we try to make it a wonderful experience when you use us. Uh, but you know, there's, there's a direct option for audible through ACX. Uh, Kobo is working on something where you'll be able to direct upload uh, through Kobo Writing Life, your audiobook, and there's a couple others, but you know, there's the the the, the value of the aggregator in the audiobook space is much higher because there's not an alternative uh, mm. for a lot of vendors. So Apple has, I think they're up to six or seven preferred partners where you can get through uh, right now, and we are one of them. Uh, but they, they don't, they haven't opened up a direct upload yet. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's I'm good. not sure that they will. I I, I don't know either way. Uh, but that's a great point to make. So, yeah, I, I, we've, we've had, um, get with mainly with my wife's books that are wide, um, some interesting email interchanges with Apple with the debt process. So that was like, <laughs> we're done with this. <laughs> so, so, uh, the other, uh, interesting bit of news, this just dropped a couple weeks ago, which is chirp. So okay. chirp is a new, uh, audiobook platform from BookBub. So uh, you probably know BookBub, uh, your, your followers probably know BookBub. They are in the audiobook game now, and it's really exciting entry to the audiobook space. Uh, and if you're familiar with BookBub, you know that they do uh, time-boxed deals for eBooks. So they do deep discounts on eBooks. They have uh, you know, a gazillion followers that they email out every day with, you know, I, I like these genres, and then these are the deals in those genres, and they match up readers with books in a... You know, they, they're very good at it, mm. let's say. Like, they're very effective there. Um, so it works a little bit different in the audiobook space. So I think everybody just jumps to that conclusion that, oh, this is BookBub for audio. There must be a daily email deal that goes to subscribers with links to the audiobook retailers. But that's not the case. Uh, Chirp is actually the retailer in this case. So they're building up this list of, of listeners they're mm -hmm. engaging them every day with these deep discounts, but they are the retailer. So when you go to buy a book through Chirp, you're going to their website, the Chirp website. You're not going to Audible. You're not going to Google or Apple to buy it. You're listening uh, in the Chirp apps, uh, both Android and iOS, and you're buying from Chirp. So this is really interesting to me because uh, BookBub is so good at matching readers with uh, all, uh, you know, the books that they want to read. Mm -hmm. And they're putting all their weight uh, behind this audio solution where they're incentivized by being the retailer uh, as opposed to, you know, just linking out to all the other players. And, and I think one of the big reasons there is it, you can't set your price on Audible and that's a big part of the market. And how can you do a discount or a deal with Audible when everything's, you, yeah, you can't, they're gonna just can't control the price and everything's behind a, a credit model anyway. So I think that they really found a good niche in the audiobook market to to um, leverage here. And I'm super. They just launched. They're still in beta. Um, if you want your audiobook to be considered for a chirp deal, uh, you need to be wide. You can't be exclusive with Audible. And they partnered with us, Findaway, uh, to provide the audiobooks. So if you're with Findaway Voices, your audiobook is already available to their team. Okay. Uh, having your book on Findaway doesn't guarantee a chirp deal but it does make the book available to their editorial team. Sure. Uh, and then they have a waiting list. So if you're, if you're interested, you know, search for the, the chirp 
uh, announcement, or you can search on the blog.findawayvoices.com. We have a big announcement. And you can sign up on the Chirp waitlist to be notified when they launch and to apply for, for an audiobook deal. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, and y- like you said, you're, you're already in that game. If, you're, if I, my books are up on your system, they're, they can be considered. Right? That's right. right. Yeah, there's nothing I else have to do, do uh, um, other than sign up on their wait, li- wait list. Yes. Yeah, and bag. Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> just like everything else with that, right? Um, I, there's but, you no know, potential here. Yeah. Well, what I think is really profound about what they're doing is, is that like, so they have a, they have a lot of information from their mailing list and how people react on their mailing list and interact with their mailing list. Um, but now they're going, they've gone this next layer where they're going to have that, that transactional data and know that these people have bought. Right. Right. And that those are going to be their customers. That's a super, super big deal. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, and to think of, you know, they had a, they've got a really nice business to, to decide that this is what they were going to put their resources into is I think very telling to the marketplace. It isn't focused on eBooks. It's focused on audio. Right. Yeah, Chirp is all audio. They and they have such a, they have such a smart team. They are you know amazing people. If you've ever met their team at shows, they're just the most wonderful, welcoming people. And and they really care about authors. They care about the author community. They love you know readers and listeners. They're beloved by everybody. So it's it's such a good partnership and such a good good thing for the audiobook industry. Mm. It's great. And I, I, again, it's like for me, it just is like okay, well, they could have done this with eBooks, but they didn't. They did it with audiobooks. Okay. So it, people should be really paying attention to that and how this, this is an op- in my view, an opportunity to kind of get going in a space that's, you know, it's kind of newer, it's earlier, much earlier innings than the, 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 um, the ebook market. Right. So much, um, well, so much opportunity and potential. Yeah. It's such a good time to be wide with your audiobooks, to be yeah. to be able to be the first person in to this kind of deal and not be, you know, locked into exclusivity. This is the kind of thing like two years ago, this was unimaginable. Uh, but but in the last two years, so much growth has happened in the audiobook market. So many things like this have just completely shifted the landscape. Do you have, uh, do you have any feel for like um, a comparative in a particular, in- you know, and just maybe just start with nonfiction, the number of titles that are available in audiobook versus just general titles. Like, you know, there's Amazon says they got 7 million titles. Do you have a feel for like how many audiobook titles are out there? Um, I will tell you that in audio engine, which is uh, the audiobook API from find a way, um, we have about 250,000 titles, uh, 250,000 audiobooks. So a lot of those are from the big publishers. You know, I can tell you all the big publishers in the world are making audiobooks for everything. They are not, unless uh, I was at London Book Fair last week and there was a, a quote from, uh, I think it was the head of P- Penguin Random House. I, I could be wrong on the, the attribution there, but they said, if it's not a cookbook or a picture book, uh, it's getting made into an audiobook. They are mm. one for one on every audio, uh, every book that they, they sign. So you know, I, I often look to the biggest publishers and see what they're doing. Uh, and they are not skipping on audiobooks for anything. So I, you know, the, that is the, the attitude and the, the sentiment from the biggest players in the industry is that they're not, it, that's not a, a market to skimp on or, or miss out on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other thing that they're doing for everything is simultaneous release. So they're making sure that audiobook is ready on day one. They're not releasing mm-hmm. the ebook and the print book and then following up six weeks later for, with the audiobook. They're waiting until everything's ready and putting it all out in market at once. And that's another tool that's really impactful for, for independent authors is, you know, your launch day, the day that you have been planning for and working towards, and you are now the talk of the town for this one day that you've planned for. you got to make sure that your audiobook is ready on that day too, so that you can leverage all that excitement. People are going to see your book. They're going to go search for it on Audible or Google or Apple. And if they don't find your audiobook, they're probably going to forget about it. Mm. You've got to leverage that moment of launch to, yeah, to be really, the most impactful. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, within say fiction, I'm trying to understand if like, if there's a thousand in, if there's a thousand books that are in nonfiction and there's a hundred books um, that are both 
in audiobook and I'm trying to figure out like is, is what the saturation is. Oh, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's right. a tough one for me to answer because I don't have any uh, ins on the ebook market. I don't see ebook sales. I don't work with ebook retailers. So that's a tough one for me to kind of compare. Really, Ooh. my whole world is audiobooks. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I can see a lot within the audiobook market and breakdowns there. But uh, I don't have a whole lot of context in uh, ebooks versus audiobooks or what the saturation is. I, I know that there are millions more ebooks than audiobooks, but beyond yeah. that, I don't, I don't have those breakdowns because I don't have that kind of that deep sales uh, mm. insight that I do in yeah. the, the audiobooks. No, I was just seeing if there was a way to figure it out. I mean, anecdotally, I, I'm just assuming it's a, it's a, it's an early entry market right now. I've got, if I can, if I can get into that market now, I'm going to have, you know, an early mover advantage versus. Yeah. I think we are still in that phase where there's still a lot of potential and there's still a good amount of, of self-published and independent authors that are either thinking about their audiobooks later uh, or just writing it off and saying, ah, my, I'm not a listener, so I don't believe my, my readers are going to be listeners. And mm -hmm. I think uh, there's still enough people that are making those mistakes that there is a first mover advantage for the people who are thinking ahead, treating their audiobook like a business asset, uh, leveraging it in all of their marketing and, and holistically with their whole strategy for getting their book to market. Um, you know, having, just having that Amazon page where somebody goes to the, your book and they see, oh, it's available on hardcover and paperback and ebook and audiobook, And you got the full lineup. There's, mm. there's still a, you know, perception of legitimacy that comes with that, that puts you on another plane from somebody who just has an ebook and doesn't even have print on demand or doesn't have an audio book. There's, so I think because consumers still notice that, that I think that's a good indicator that we are still early. Uh, and there is a, a you know first mover advantage for a lot of authors. Yeah, and I I completely agree. And I think the other thing in it is it's like you look at a um, you know any of the soft drink manufacturers, Coca Cola, Pepsi, like they've saturated. You know, cola. What do they do? They buy mineral water. They buy <laughs> coconut water, right? Like they 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 have to figure out like okay, there's really the, the, it's diminishing returns to try and get any more than just kind of natural growth in the marketplace. Right. So what do we do if we want to grow our sales, which we have an obligation to do, we got to go into these other markets. Yep. We're not trying to convert cola drinkers to coconut water drinkers. We don't think they're the same people. We just want to get more, you know, drinkers Absolutely. and stuff. So like, that's, I think, for authors, I understand being pure to the written word, but um, you're, you're limiting your business when you're not looking at your intellectual property, your creativity in the different ways that you can get it out to market. Yep, absolutely. Um, There's a whole world of listeners out there that don't overlap with your readers. Yeah. There's a whole blue, blue ocean there for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I observed when I did my Kickstarter was there was um, people that sent me messages when they pledged and they're like, this is really great. I've been looking for books in this genre on audiobook. I haven't been able to find any. Nice. Right. Like, so yeah. it wasn't every single, it was two or three, but it's like that really demonstrates to me that there's, there's more opportunity than I thought there was. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And I'm not even look. That's a market. Pl that's a place where it's not really a target rich environment for audio books, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's been great talking to you, Will. I know uh, we've gone a little over time, but that's <laughs> that's all right. This is a blast. Show. Yeah. This was so much fun. Thank you so much for having me on. I, you know, I obviously love talking about this stuff and could talk for several more hours. Uh, but it was great talking with you and, and learn about some of your experiences as well as being able to share uh, some of the insights and, and, you know, perspectives I have on, on the audiobook market. Yeah. And we'd love to have you on again later once um, some of these things are coming off beta to help our, our people are watching to start, you know, using these tools because, um, you know, if you want to, you want to sell people your intellectual property, this is going to be clearly one of the big ways that you're going to do it in the next 10 years i can see yeah I'm, we believe that too we're banking on it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you've got a lot more investing <laughs> all right well thanks a lot will thank you
Bye.